Okay, we are in the third segment of our exploration of the Enigma of Edom. And in this segment, we're going to focus on the eschatological or end time implications of uh, what we've seen in the Word of God. And uh, the first segment, you may recall, we explored the biblical background and the origin of the everlasting hatred. And the second segment, of course, we reviewed uh, rather superficially, perhaps, but still the judgment upon Edom, particularly the book of Obadiah. Well, in this segment, we're going to talk about the eschatological implications of all that's going on before. We're going to touch a little bit about the Magog invasion, and we're going to touch on the an alternate view of that episode. We're going to talk about Psalm 83 as apparently a prelude to the whole Ezekiel 38 and 39 episode. And then we're also going to find out why do the rabbis regard the Edomites as an idiom for the imperial globalists. And finally, we'll talk a little bit about the epistemological cycle that motivates the tying together of all of these things. We're going to start by taking a look at the Magog invasion. And I think most of us who've studied the Bible are familiar with Ezekiel 38 and 39. And this passage is well known for two dominant reasons. The first one, it's the occasion in which God himself intervenes to quell an ill-fated attempt to invade Israel. And that invasion is planned and led by Magog, and he assembles a group of allies. So that's the first reason it's so well known. The second reason it's so well known, uh, and it lists, by the way, all the allies, Persia, Cush, Put, Libya, Gomer, Tagarma, Meshach, and Tubal, all by their ancient tribal names, which are start in Genesis chapter 10 and following. But the second reason that uh, it's so well known is it appears to elude or anticipate the use of nuclear weapons. And it's not our intent to go through the whole thing. I'm going to presume that most of you are familiar with it. Basically, we have Magog, who arms and leads a group of uh, nations to invade Israel uh, for spoil, actually. And uh, there's a couple strange ones that are on the sidelines that aren't participating nor defending. Deba and Sheba are on the sidelines for some reason. But one of the things that's disturbing if we study the passage carefully is it describes Israel as being in peace and without walls. Now we know all about walls. The major wall of China done in 200 BC was a, was a wall to, be keep, to keep Magog out of China. Another wall we're all familiar with is the Berlin Wall in 1961. But today in Israel there is a wall 25 feet high that's 430 miles long. And it's hard for us to reconcile that reality, that political reality, with a passage from Eze in Ezekiel 38. It certainly seems that there are some preparatory steps being taken on the global scene that seem to be setting the stage for Ezekiel 38. The Arab-Israeli conflict, of course, is part of it. The emergence of Iran as a nuclear power is in the news every day. The oil discoveries in the Caspian Sea between Russia and Iran are a factor. But all these would seem to be preparatory steps in advance of the main event of Ezekiel 38 and 39. But there's a problem here. Because as you study the passage, it's interesting that there is no mention of Israel's immediate neighbors. All the players that are listed in Ezekiel 38 are distant nations further uh, around the nation Israel. The immediate neighbors are not there. Let's take a look at them. Where are the Palestinians? Where are the Lebanese? Where are the Syrians? Where is Iraq? Where are the Jordanians? By whatever name you want to put on them. Where are the Egyptians? What about Saudi Arabia? Now, they're on the sidelines not participating. That's all very strange. In fact, if we look at the whole situation, each one of the neighboring uh, uh, or, uh, organizations, the Palestinians, Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, Jordan, Saudi Arabia, and Egypt, are conspicuous in their non-participation of Ezekiel 38. So, in fact, as you stand back from Ezekiel 38 and look at chapter 37, which of course is the famous dry bones vision that where they're regathered, we notice there in chapter 37, Ezekiel says, Then said he unto me, Prophesy unto the wind, prophesy, son of man, and say to the wind, Thus saith the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. 
And we have the four winds, of course, the four winds of heaven that are mentioned in Jeremiah 49 and elsewhere. They're sort of a symbol of the, the universal life-giving spirit of God. But then we have a strange verse 10 that many of us perhaps have failed to fully embrace. Ezekiel says, So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came in unto them, and they lived and stood up on their feet, an exceedingly great army. So there's three steps here. They were scattered originally, and they came together flesh and skin, uh, but still as dead bodies in the idiom of the vision. Then they came to life. Great. But notice this last thing. They became an exceedingly great army. Now the... the uh, Israeli Defense Force certainly have done a, a quit of themselves pretty well as a defensive force around uh, uh, Israel, but you really wouldn't see them as an exceedingly great army. And that phrase, by the way, is an adverbial phrase, which makes it even more provocative. So is it possible that Israel, standing alone now, really with no allies, including America, turning their back on them, may say to the world, Nuts to you guys. We're going to defend and seek our rights. Are they going to be strong enough to stand? That's what the psalmist talks about in Psalm 83. And it seems to us as we examine this, Psalm 83 may describe an element of the scenario that we have overlooked, an event that has to precede Ezekiel 38. Let's take a look at it. This is the last of the, the, the Asaph series of Psalms. And... Uh, he says, the says, it's a prayer to God. It says, keep not thou silence, O God. Hold not thy peace. Be not still, O God, for lo, thine enemies, in other words, the enemies of God, thine enemies make a tumult, and they that hate thee have lifted up the head. This is a challenge by the psalmist to God that God's enemies are lifting their head, and it's calling on God to deal with this. Notice what he says here. And by the way, Whoever these enemies are that he's talking about, they hate God. Not just Israel, they hate God. He, the psalmist continues, They have taken crafty counsel against thy people and consulted against thy hidden ones. Now that's a peculiar phrase. The hidden ones? I don't want to make too much of this. I wouldn't build doctrine on it. But it, at least suggestive, these hidden ones, could they be the raptured church? Is this something that occurs after the harpazo? I wouldn't build a case on it, but the hint would seem to be there. Let's move on. The psalmist the psalm says to God, he says, they have said, come, let us cut them off from being a nation. Boy, does that ring familiar today? Let us cut them off from being a nation that the name of Israel may be no more in remembrance. They have consulted together with one consent. They are confederate against thee. Against who? Against God. I want you to notice the difference in motivation when you study Ezekiel 38 and 39. The motivation is to take spoil. They come down for cattle, goods, gold, and silver. They're coming to take advantage. No, this group, whoever they are, are confederated to wipe Israel off the face of the earth. Notice he goes on here. The very commitment, this is the very commitment of Islam, to wipe Israel off the face of the map. And that's the primary basis of their confederation, interestingly enough. You know, it's interesting that in Islam, the two houses of Islam, the Sunnis and the Shiites, hate each other almost as much as they hate the Jews. But they are confederated for the one purpose of wiping Israel off the face of the map. And we have, obviously, very articulate spoke, spokesmen that make that very clear as their objective. So let's go on to see what the psalmist says here. He's going to describe these people that have confederated themselves to wipe Israel off the map. The first one he mentions are the tabernacles of Edom. He goes on, the tabernacles of Edom, the Ishmaelites of Moab and the Hagarines, Gebal and Ammon and Malak, uh, Malak, I should say, and the Philistines and the inhabitants of Tyre. Asher's joined with them and they have hoped or helped the children of Lot. That's it. The tabernacles of Edom. Now that's why this is so in, in front of us, because we need to understand who they are. Edom, of course, we've learned from the last couple of segments particularly, are the traditional enemies of Israel. The tents, the tabernacles, the tents of Edom, are in the papers all the time. We know them as the Palestinian refugees. And they speak, of course, of the southern Jordanians specifically. The tents of Edom. You want pictures of them? Here are some pictures of the tents of Edom that you can find in the press. 
and uh, in all shapes and sizes. There's here's one of them that has 96,000 population. It's the it's the palace what we call the Palestinian refugees, made refugees by the politics of their Arab neighbors. Not realize they're just the pawns of the Arab politics. So we have the Ishmaelites, and of course that reminds you. Remember what it says about Ishmael in Genesis 16: He'll be a wild man, and his hand will be against every man, and every man's hand against him. And that certainly describes the history of the Ishmaelites. Arabs are often called the sons of the East in that very vein. And at the last seg previous segment, we looked at the fact that Isaac has Esau and Jacob, the twins in the tomb. But Esau deliberately, out of spite to his father, marries a, a, a Ishmaelite and intervenes the offspring then so they all can be rega regarded as Ishmaelites or what we loosely call the Arabs, which would include not just the Saudi Arabians but the Bedouins and so on. So we have uh, then of Moab, and, and of course uh, that's a descendant of Lot and uh, the Palestinian refugees, and Central Jordan could be suggested by that phrase. And then we have the Hagarenes. Now the, the descendants of Hagar were, of course, Egyptians. That doesn't mean all Egyptians are Hagarenes, but certainly Hagarenes is a description of uh, in that direction. And then we have Jabal, and uh, that's the, probably the northern Lebanese. Now that term actually has two possibilities. The word means line or natural boundary, is a mountain range, and it can refer to a tract of land in Edom southeast of the Dead Sea, which go, comes by Jabal, and it's called uh, Gobolitis by Josephus and so forth. There's also a, a Phoenician city up in the north, not far from the seacoast, uh, north of Beirut, that's called by the Greeks Byblos, but now it's Jebel, and uh, it's mentioned in the Armana tablets. Um, uh, there's different scholars that point to different directions. It doesn't really change your argument, but just to be aware of the fact, the fact that the, the Jebel is put in the text between the Hagarenes and Ammon favors viewing them as Idumeans, but our case doesn't rest on that. Let's move on. Uh, Ammon, of course, is the Palestinian refugees that, from the northern Jordanians, if you will, and uh, the capital of Jordan is Amman, after all. And then we have Amalek, which is south of, Jer uh, uh, south of Jerusalem. Uh, remember, uh, 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 of the Amaleks, we had Agag, the king of the Amalekites, and out of him we got Haman and the whole story of H Esther and so forth. And then we have the Philistines, and they, again, they would be included in the Palestinian refugees, and the Hamas, if you will, of the Gaza Strip would fit that description. And then we have the inhabitants of Tyre, and that would be Hezbollah, and the southern Lebanese, if you will. And uh, Asher would be allusion to Assyria, not to be confused with Syria itself, but would include Syria and northern Iraq as, as a geographic designation. And then they have the strange word, they have hope in the children of God. That's an old English term meaning be an arm to, if you will, or help to. And of course the children of Lot uh, also again echoes uh, Moab and Ammon in this case. So uh, that's the psalm. But that goes on, as the psalmist having identified the enemies that are dealt with, that are confederate here, it calls upon God to do unto them what he did back in Judges. Uh, do unto them as unto the Midianites, as unto Sisera and Yabin at the brook of Kisan, which perished at Endor. They became as dung for the earth. He's using a historical example in terms of what he's calling God to do. Now the Midianites, of course, that was an Arabian tribe that descended from Midian, the fourth son of uh, Abraham by Keturah. They inhabited principally the desert north of the peninsula of Arabia, in Genesis 25, and so on. Sisera, of course, was the captain of the host of Yavin and uh, the Canaanite king who reigned at Hazor. And he, routed, he was routed by the army of Barak and the plain of Esterlon killed by Yael in Judges 4 and 5. So the psalmist is calling upon, using these historical victories as an example of what he's calling God to do here, if you will. So do unto them as to the Midianites, as to Sisera and Yavin at the brook of Kisun, and uh, which perished at Endor, and they became as dung for the earth. Now, Endor is a little uh, uh, town on uh, the uh, northern slope of Her Little Hermon, about seven miles from Jezreel. That's the place in the territory of Issachar near the scene of the great victory by Deborah and Barak over Sisera and Jabin. It also happens to be the place where Saul resorted to consult the witch, that we remember that so well, uh, on the eve of his fatal engagement with the Philistines. But he then goes on to say, make their nobles like Oreb and Zeb, yea, all their princes as Zeba and Salmuna. And uh, just to refresh your memory, Oreb and Zeb were the prince generals of Midian, 
and Zeba and Zalmunna were their kings. So the two generals and the two kings that were, you know, wiped out uh, by uh, Barak and Deborah and all of that are the illusions here. And uh, these guys, the guys that got defeated, said, who said, let us take to ourselves the houses of God in procession. But they see they were defeated by Gideon, the men of Ephraim, intercepted the Midianites and slew with a great slaughter in Judges 7 and 8, if you will. So Judges 4, 5, and 7, and 8 are the background that the psalmist is using in calling God to deal with this arrogant confederacy that's being formed here. He, the psalmist continues, O oh my God, make them like a wheel, as the stubble before the wind, as the fire burneth a wood, and as the flame setteth the mountains on fire. So persecute them with thy tempest, and make them afraid with thy storm. Fill their faces with shame, that they may seek thy name, O Lord. Let them be confounded and troubled forever. Yea, let them be put to shame and perish. Notice that that shame comes up again and again, again echoing the pride that motivates it in the first place. But anyway, let them be put to shame and perish, that men may know that thou, whose name alone is Yehovah, or as the rabbis might say, yod heh vav but anyway, art the most high over all the earth. Now that's interesting. See, the issue the psalmist is calling is to God that men may know that thou whose name alone is Yehovah. In other, that's in incon that's Yehovah in contrast to Al-Elah, the moon god. That's implied here. Apparently, the only way this world is going to know that God is God is for him to move in judgment. Wow. So, as we study the judgment upon the nations, the, the, one of the most important passages of that is in Ezekiel from chapter 25 through 32. Ezekiel deals with seven major adversaries to the interests of God. Ammon, Moab, Edom, Philistia, Tyre, Sidon, and Egypt. And these have different ethnic roots. Some are Japheth, some are Shem, some are Ham. But what they have in common is they are all Islamic. One of the things God is going to deal with assertively is the destruction of Islam in a way that will demonstrate and manifest that God is God. And so the enemies here, the present time, Israel is surrounded by immediate neighbors who are committed to wiping them off the map. Those aren't the players of Ezekiel 38. In fact, quite the contrary is implied by Ezekiel 38. Israel is prosperous and at peace. Wow. It's misleading, by the way, to represent these neighbors as Arabs. And they're not Arabs, they're Muslims. That's what they have in common. And it would seem, as you study this passage, Psalm 83, in the light of Ezekiel 38, that Psalm 83 it seems to indicate there's a prerequisite victory for Israel that will set the stage for the subsequent ill-fated attempt to invade uh, uh, Israel by these outer ring of nations. Even that God doesn't let happen, but it's interesting, the context of that attempt implies Israel is, is uh, in peace and uh, prosperous, prosperous enough to attract them, not for ideological reasons, just for greed, for spoil, is the point. That's the point of Ezekiel. We often miss that. That outer ring of nations is seeking spoils. And so, this implies an order of events that may be different than we've commonly suspected in our conventional studies here. Obviously, Israel is regathered in the land as Ezekiel 37 and Isaiah 11 and Deuteronomy 30 portray. Ancient cities are rebuilt and inhabited as Ezekiel 36 and other passages represent. They meet, of course, Muslim or Arab resistance, if you want to call it that, and that's all through the scripture. But Israel establishes an army for defense in Ezekiel 36 verses 6 and 7, and that shows up in Ezekiel 38, a defensive posture. But the adjacent Muslim nations, apparently confederate, as profiled here in Psalm 83, the first eight verses, this confederacy is specifically committed to the destruction of Israel, not for spoil, for destruction. War starts then between the confederacy and Israel, and the title apparently is regained, My People Israel. And when you study Hosea, you may recall that they are designated as not my people for a while, but the day comes when they regain that designation, and that appears to happen here. And uh, so we have, then Israel decisively defeats that confederacy. 
And that's what all these passages seem to indicate, which is, includes, of course, the judgment upon Edom. Israel then becomes an exceedingly great army, as described in Ezekiel 37, verse 10, and also alluded to in Jeremiah 49, 21. Israel takes prisoners of war. That's all through those passages. The region is reshaped in accordance with the original uh, uh, covenant to, uh, by, by, to given to Abraham. So Israel expands its borders, and Israel then dwells securely in the land, and that sets the stage for Ezekiel 38. So this segment of God's plan, apparently, is to be fulfilled, Psalm 83. Then the ill-fated Magog invasion attempt will be ready, as described in Ezekiel 38 and 39. So we want, is there another missing link here? Okay, we've talked about Edom, and the possibility that it's the key to Psalm 83. Good. There is another dimension to this enigma of who are the Edomites today. There's more to it than just that. And this, this other dimension emerges from careful study. See, metaphors tend to reign where mysteries reside. When we don't quite understand something, we give it a label to cover up the fact that we don't really understand it. Well, who are the Edomites really? It's interesting that the Orthodox rabbis regard international globalists as Edomites. And when I first went in, I thought, gee, that's a strange idiom for them to use. These people, you know, we think of there are certain power groups and what have you that are uh, pursuing a global government. The rabbis refer to them as Edomites, and that puzzled me. I want to track that down. This is a term they use in referring to Rome or any ruling empire. When Rome was ruling in the, in the New Testament period, the rabbis regarded the Edomites as conspirators with them. No wonder all the Herods were appointed by Rome to be... See, they were viewed by Rome as near Jews, if you will. So that's, that be, may be enough, but there's something more going on here, perhaps. Why do they regard the globalists as Edomites? Well, let's just examine the life of one example. A gentleman by the name of Amschel Moses Bauer. In 1743, a goldsmith named Amschel Moses Bauer opened a coin shop in Frankfurt, Germany. He hung above his door a sign depicting a Roman eagle on a red shield. And uh, the shop became known as the Red Shield Firm. Amschel Bauer had a son, Meyer Amschel Bauer. At a very early age, Meyer showed that he possessed immense intellectual ability. And his father spent much uh, of his time teaching him everything he could about the money lending business and its, the basic dynamics of finance. A few years after his father's death in 1755, Meyer went to work in Hanover as a clerk in a bank owned by the Oppenheimers. His superior ability was quickly recognized and his advancement within that firm was very swift. His success there gave him the means to return to Frankfurt and purchase the business his father had established back in 1743. The red shield was still displayed over the door. Recognizing the true significance of the red shield, See, his father had adopted it as his emblem from the red flag, which was the emblem of the revolutionary-minded Jews in Eastern Europe. So Meyer Amschel Bauer changed his name to Red Shield. In German, that's Rothschild, Red Shield. We mispronounce it and call it Rothschild. No, it's actually not Rothschild, it's Red Shield is what the term really means. The German word for red shield is Rothschild, in other words. It was at this point that the house of Rothschild came into being. Through his experience with the Oppenheimers, Meyer Rothschild learned that the loaning money to governments and kings was much more profitable than loaning to private individuals. Not only were the loans bigger, but they were secured by the nation's taxes. And that leads to the whole strategy that's made them one of the most powerful financial organizations in the world. Meyer Rothschild had five sons, Amschel, Salomon, Nathan, Carl, and Yaakov. 
Meyer spent the rest of his life instructing them on, in all the secret techniques of money creation and manipulation. As they came of age, he sent them to the major capitals of Europe to open branch offices of the family banking business. Amschel stayed in Frankfurt. Solomon was sent to Vienna. Nathan was sent to London. Carl went to Naples. And Jacob went to Paris. In 1838, not to go through that whole history, I think most of you are ahead of me by now, but in 1838, Nathan made the following statement, very prov provocative insight. Permit me to issue and control the money of a nation, and I care not who makes its laws. See, the power behind the scenes, the invisible power behind the scenes, is something that most people do not understand how it works, and that's where the real power lies. So the saga of this whole thing continues with involvements with Adam Weishaupt, who formed the Illuminati, and... Uh, the secret meetings on Jekyll Island, Georgia, which established the Federal Reserve. They all take color from this history. And we could go on and on about that sort of thing. But I want to change the subject a little bit and, and talk about something else. Jesus Christ, uh, you know, we say, how many epistles are there in the, New, in the New Testament? We usually say 21. 14 Pauline epistles and seven others. We always overlook seven by the Lord Jesus himself. The, the seven letters to seven churches in Revelation. And as we study those letters, and it's, it's probably, the, of all the books in the Bible, the, one, the only book that has the audacity to say, read me, I'm special, is the book of Revelation. It carries a special blessing. No other book claims a special blessing for it alone. Revelation does. And as you study that book, you quickly discover that the most important, most relevant parts of that book are chapters 2 and 3, these seven letters by Jesus Christ himself. As we study these letters, they have seven elements. Jesus selects a name for himself from the first chapter. He selects a title from the first chapter. Then he has a report card, something good said and something bad said and some concerns, a commendation, some concerns, and an exhortation. And then it closes with, an, uh, with a, cl a strange closing thing I'll come to in a minute. And then there's a promise to the overcomer. Now it's interesting that two of these letters have nothing bad uh, have nothing good said about them. Every letter has something good and something bad, except two have nothing good said about them. Sardis and Laodicea are conspicuous, and there's nothing good said about what. One of the lessons out of this whole thing is every one of the churches are surprised. Those that thought they were doing well were not, and those that thought they weren't doing well were. So that should give us humility to understand God's view of how we're doing may, quite, may be quite different than ours. And the letters have four levels of application. They have, per, they have literal local application at the time. They have an application to all churches because of a plurality that's used there. And it's also application to every one of us personally. Those three levels are pretty obvious. There's a fourth layer that's very, fourth layer of, of insight that's very surprising. But first of all, let's, let's notice carefully the structure of these letters. Two of them have no commendation. They was, Jesus didn't find anything positive to say about either Sardis or Laodicea. Interestingly, there are two that Jesus had nothing negative to say about them. And we're going to double back on those two for some very unusual reasons. Smyrna is one, and Philadelphia. Those two letters had nothing, no concerns. He, he commended them, gave them some exhortations, but it was basically to hang in there and so forth. And each one of these letters has a strange closing phrase. He that hath an ear hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Notice the plural, which means they all apply to all of us in some way or another. But there's something very strange structurally as we study these carefully. We notice that in the first three of these letters, the promise to the overcomer is like a postscript. It's, it's after the letter's complete. There's a little promise to the, he that overcometh, I'll do this and that. And there's three, there's seven different promises to the overcomer. The first three, they're like a PS. And the, la and, and the last four, they are in the body of the letter. Now, if nothing else, that suggests that there's something distinctive about the last four that's different than the first three. And, we'll with, and as we study that, we'll go, we're going to focus specifically, by the way, on some observations about uh, uh, we notice there's two that had nothing um, good said about them. But the two we really want to focus on for this little study is there are two that had no concerns. They're doing well. But they have a very strange phrase that's just in those two letters for some reason. 
And uh, we'll take a look at that. Now, one of the things that's surprising when you study these, you discover that those seven letters lay out the history of the church throughout the last 2,000 years. We have Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Good. Ephesus is very descriptive of the apostolic church, the church of the first century. And that's something we won't take the time to go through all of that. When you study that, you'll discover that every detail in that letter supports that view. Each one of these letters has a characteristic issue and, uh, that, uh, that fits the situation. Smyrna, that's a word for myrrh or embalming ointment, ointment. that was the persecuted church. And, uh, and uh, what Satan couldn't accomplish by persecuting the church, he gained by marrying, have the world marrying the church. Bigamy, monogamy, those are words for marriage. Pergamy is a perverted marriage, is the idea. And uh, that's the church, when the church married the world. That's when that, that created uh, all kinds of problems. From out of that came the medieval church, and from that we see the denominational church. Out of that we get to the missionary church, and then the final stage is the apostate church. And most people who have studied this uh, uh, carefully would argue that we are in that seventh stage. And that in itself is provocative, not only in terms of our behavior and our concerns, but also to realize that we're getting to the climax of what some people would call the church age. So, but what's interesting, we notice that the first three have the promises to the overcomer subscripted. Okay, that's interesting. The last four have the promises in the body of the letter. As we look at that to see is there something else about that structure that's provocative, we also notice that the last four, each of them uniquely have an explicit reference to the second coming of Christ. That's pretty interesting. In fact, we notice that the first of those four has a specific promise that they will go into the Great Tribulation. So we tend to, we lean to the view that these last four are contemporaneous to the end. The first three describe periods that are behind us to, in a large extent, in many ways, but these four are yet coming forward. One of Thyatira is promised that if they, unless they repent, they'll be going into the Great Tribulation. Well, that applies if they do repent, they won't. That's interesting. Philadelphia has the express promise that they will be removed from the very time of the Great Tribulation. And as far as the other two, that's problematical, perhaps. But it's interesting that when you start studying the eschatological passages, we begin to understand the role, mission, and hazards of the church itself. And that's what makes that area so instructive for all of us. But it's interesting that it, in the letter to Smyrna, there's a very strange allusion in Revelation chapter 2, verse 9, Jesus says, I know thy works, and tribulation, and poverty, but thou art rich, and I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews, and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Right? Strange remark. What makes it even stranger is in the letter to Philadelphia, we have a similar remark. Jesus says, Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee. It's interesting that these two, these two insertions are with Smyrna and Philadelphia. That's the only place that, those also happen to be the two letters which have nothing negative said about them, which is interesting. We notice that Smyrna is under the heel of Rome in a persecuted way, so that's an issue. We know that Philadelphia apparently is pulled out from under the, you know, the, the whole Great Tribulation and all of that. So they have that somewhat uh, as a, an echo of one another, perhaps. There are good scholars that have different theories and conjectures as to what these might re, uh, uh, relate to. But I'm increasingly... Uh, lean to the view that they're dealing here with Edomites that are in power of various kinds, that are influencing the world scene in the, sa in the same sense that the Herods of, of, of the New Testament period are, uh, that those Edomites that were powerful in the Roman structure as time went on migrated uphill. And as we see elements here and there in a society, and I, I don't know what the basis of the, uh, of the Orthodox are, 
with respect to Rockefeller and Roosevelt, there's theories and stuff. I don't know if I buy into any of that, but the probability that this is an allusion to Edomites who say they are Jews and aren't really, in fact, they are the sworn enemy of the Jews, and they're the, the uh, Olam Eba, the, the uh, everlasting hatred, is my suspicion. But it's a suspicion. I don't want to oversell it. You need to do your own study and come to your own conclusions, but do it with diligence and be precise and do your homework and come to your own conclusions. But there's another lesson I'd like to just uh, wrap up with here as we go through this thing, and that is what uh, uh, I think most of you have probably seen me use this chart before. As we look at eschatology, your first choice as you study the end time, eschatology is very challenging to most pastors because for eschatology, you really need to have the whole plan of God in view. And that makes it very challenging. It's one reason why many people are nervous about getting into this. Uh, eschatology suffers from its enthusiasts as much as its detractors. There's many people that don't study it that, that should because it's a tremendous apologetic, it's a, a, a tremendous way to demonstrate the reality and the truth of the Bible. But it also suffers from its enthusiasts, people that get into it and have their strange views and try to set dates, and so it, has, it suffers from both extremes, if you will. But the first place you encounter is a choice, are you amillennial or premillennial? And the tragedy is the amillennial are people who don't take the millennium seriously, they think it's just an allegory. And uh, uh, most of us, obviously, are premillennial. We take that very seriously for a number of reasons. But that's the first choice. The tragedy is that probably nine, tenths, uh, nine churches out of ten, uh, in America at least, are amillennial, don't really uh, believe in or understand that the millennium is simply the fulfillment of, uh, the, of God's uh, Davidic uh, covenant. But uh, there used to be a post a group that thought the millennium had already started, but when the 20th century turned out to be the most violent century in the history of man, uh, that view is pretty much subsided. There's an issue called preterism, which is really a form of amillennialism, and reconstructionism. Those are really deviant things I won't get into here. But among the premillennial people, there's also divisions of when do you, where does the, where's the rapture take place? And there's post-trib, mid-trib, and pre-trib. And the point of this little chart is just simply this. Most denominations are amillennial and post-tribulational. But most Bible-centered uh, churches are at the right end of this chart. They're premillennial and pre-tribulational. The point I'm making here is simply this. If I know your hermeneutics, your theory of how you treat the text, uh, your hermeneutics will determine where you end up here. If you have what we call a soft hermeneutics, you're willing to regard the text as just symbolic or allegorical, you'd be on the left hand of this end of this chart. If you take a very high hermeneutic, you take the... You're very strict with the precision. You, you believe that God means what he says and says what he means, even to the letters and numbers. You swing to the right. So the point of, I know where you are in that profile, I can predict where you'll end up uh, eschatologically. Are right, making sense? Okay. There is a cycle that I call the epistemological cycle. Epistemology is the study of knowledge, its scope and limits. And there's a cycle here. If I know your hermeneutics... I can predict your eschatology. And I've just demonstrated that with this little chart as an example of that. Well, there's a second step that's worth in, uh, exploring. If I know your, from your eschatology, you get your ecclesiology. You'll understand the church from your eschatology. If you really understand God's total program, you understand where the church fits in, you don't fall into the trap of assuming that the church replaces Israel and all that kind of stuff. So, and, and, and so that is very well demonstrated by the little chart we just used earlier in this study. But it goes one step further. From your, your ecclesiology will determine your hermeneutics. Because from your, your church background, that will determine what versions do you, do you use the message or these paraphrases? Then you, you'll miss a lot of what God is saying because they're paraphrases by people who don't necessarily grasp what the text really said. And so uh, one reason we lean to the King James isn't that the King James is better than the others. It's just better understood, and the problems are well documented and known. And so the King James has been around. And, of course, there's, there's another reason the King James, that if you like if Bible memory work, you'd like to memorize the scripture that you know will be around 20 years from now. So there's a majesty to that that will never be eclipsed. 
So that's one reason we lean to it too. But the other reason is actually uh, more and more the Dead Sea Scrolls are eclipsing what we've known about the text as they get as it gets packed. And the only version that has the advantage of that happens to be the International Standard Version Bible. It's about to be announced, and we're very much enamored with that. And, and we've been requested to do a study Bible around the ISV, and we're looking at that very seriously. But the point is, our hermeneutics determines our eschatology. Our eschatology will teach us about our ecclesiology, but our ecclesiology will impact our hermeneutics. And what's interesting about the cycle is the more the, the higher your hermeneutics, the more uh, uh, precise your eschatology, the more your understanding of your ecclesiology will take place, which will again impact your hermeneutics. So this is a regenerative cycle, and the, the main idea is that in all cases, it always points to what? Christ. And, or as the ISV says, the Messiah. But uh, so, now your challenge, you've had, we've had some fun together here, but your challenge, I want to put something on the screen, which if you accept what I put on the screen, you flunk the course. I'm sincere, I'm putting this something I really believe, but I don't want you to accept it, I want you to challenge it. And uh, I believe that you and I are being plunged into a period of time about which the Bible says more than it does about any other period of time in history, including the time that Jesus walked the shores of Galilee or climbed the mountains of Judea. Now that, that's a preposterous statement, that we're moving into a time period about which the Bible says more than it does about the gospel period. That's, that's crazy. No, I want you to, and I don't want you to accept that. I want you to challenge it. Now how do you do that? How do you challenge that preposterous statement? You've got to do two things. The first thing you got to do is find out what the Bible says, not what Chuck Missler says or anyone else. It's not, that's not to be delegated to anybody else. It's too important for that. And Jesus said that not one yard or one tittle shall pass from the law till all be fulfilled. You want to find out what it really says. Now, you and I happen to live in the most unique environment in the history of man. The Dark Ages occurred because the Word of God was not available except to, a, to an elite a cloistered group. No, today... Every one of us in this room can go to the original Hebrew and Greek without knowing Hebrew or Greek because of the tools that are available today. Incredible. The appliances we have, where many of us carry five or six Bibles in our phone. We have a laptop that has thousands of materials that are word searchable. And, and on it goes. And the internet, awesome reason. Every, all of man's knowledge is a few keystrokes away. And you can, if you have a Bible verse, and it comes up, you can click on any word and a little pop-up menu will tell you what the original Greek or Hebrew said, what the parts of speech are, it'll even diagram the sentence if you like, and the software to do that is free. Yes, there's some very nice packages around, and you can spend a lot of money if you choose to, but you don't need to, because these resources for your computer are free of charge, eSword being a best example perhaps, they're also available on the internet. If you haven't discovered the Blue Letter Bible, you're in for a treat, it's got commentaries, dictionaries, encyclopedias, all free and all word searchable, etc., etc. So check it out. But the other thing you want to do if you're really serious about your Bible, you don't learn your Bible by attending church Sunday morning. 45-minute sermon once a week doesn't do it. If you're serious about the Word of God, what you want to do is get into a small group that meets during the week for that purpose. I've been a Christian for essentially uh, more than 60 years. And in my entire life, the place I've seen people grow is in small groups, six, especially 6 to 12. Small enough where they can ask questions without embarrassment. Small enough to hold each other accountable, if you will. Small enough that you, when you pray for your neighbor, you know the names of his kids and so forth. It's an intimate group. that is, And there's a role for your Sunday uh, uh, resource. Uh, 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 but anyway, the point, if you, I encourage you to find a small group if you can't start one. You do not have to be a teacher to lead a small group. You can invite a few people over for coffee and donuts and pop a DVD into the DVD player and just listen to part of it and talk about it. And the Holy Spirit will take over. All you need to do as a leader is keep, don't let one person dominate everything, let every, get everyone to participate. The Holy Spirit will take over. You do not need to be a teacher to lead a small group. Well, that's the first step. The second step, finding out what the Bible says is step one. The step two is find out what's really going on. And I think most of us are sophisticated enough to, to know or have discovered that the mainline media is not reliable. In fact, it has an agenda of its own. Uh, Pilate anticipated, he said, what is truth? This, 
cynical question echoes through today. What is really true? You won't on the 10 o'clock news. If you want to find out what's really going on in the Middle East or wherever, there are ways to do that, but it takes some diligence. And there are resources available. And they're a totally different approach, different set of tools than you do with part one. So we live in the age of deceit. And part of what's deceiving us isn't just biblical truth that's misstated. It's also current events that are twisted and colored for someone's agenda. The, we have a media that takes pride in shaping opinions rather than informing them. We need to understand the dangers of that. The purpose of the press in a democracy is to inform the electorate. And we live in a world in which money powers really control the media. And that's dangerous if we're foolish enough to be misled by them. So, so what do you do about this? That's one of the questions we get asked. So what do you do in this thing? Well, what's your action plan? You've spent three sessions with us today on this little exploration. Has it had an impact on your life? What is God calling you to do? We can't answer that. You have to discover that for yourself. But I'm going to suggest that every one of us are a work in progress. Every one of us needs to raise the bar on our personal walk. And uh, how do you do that? How do you raise the bar? How do you improve your spiritual walk? It can involve several things, but I know one thing it will include, and that's to commit to a systematic program to really learn your Bible. And that's a lifetime thing. So I encourage you, first of all, to join or start, if you have to, a weekly study group for that very purpose. It'll be fun, you'll be enriched, and it'll be, uh, let me warn you, it's addictive. You'll have a great time. But whatever it is that God is calling you to do, Find out what it is and start now. It's the most exciting adventure. God, why did God save you? I assume you're saved. You're sitting here. You've accepted Jesus Christ. If you hadn't, deal with that right away. But if you have, then why did he save you? He saved you for a particular purpose. And the great adventure in life is to discover what that purpose is.